You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640 live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. It's later with Mo Kelly, and this is the viral load with me, Tiffany Hobbs. How are you doing, Tiffany? I'm great. Thank you very much. Let's get into the viral load tonight. The first story comes from TikTok, and it has to do with teachers using their lunchtime to do something other than break and enjoy time to themselves. No, they have gotten on TikTok. And their TikTok has become so successful that it has garnered them sponsorships. What are they doing? They formed a lunch bunch at this high school, Johnson Central High School. And their club, the JCHS Lunch Bunch, has been eating together during the school's first lunch period for years. But one day... One of the teachers decided to grab her cell phone. And what she did was she interviewed other teachers and said, what are you eating for lunch? That turned into numerous teachers over the next nine months. So the entirety of the school year answering that very simple question. Hey, what are you eating for lunch? And in the process, that teacher would record their answers, upload it to TikTok, and it just blossomed. It just ballooned. They've become stars on their own right with nearly 30,000 followers and thousands of commenters each day on TikTok. It is a beloved TikTok, not only from the school, obviously, but thousands upon thousands of thousands of other people who have taken to their account to just enjoy this very mundane activity with these teachers. Due to the popularity of their TikTok, They've gotten sponsorships, as I said, from Weight Watchers. I don't know if I like that one very much. That feels kind of, I don't know. But hey, they got sponsorships, so they're getting something free. They've gotten custom-made sweatshirts from another company. Burger King, Hardee's, Taylor Farms. All of these businesses have reached out because of their regular interaction on the TikToks. They've given them all this free stuff and all this free publicity. They've even gotten recognized at local restaurants, at airports, at concerts, and even at University of Kentucky football games. So these educators in this very small town have taken their small town school and made it into a state wide phenomenon, all from the simple question of, hey, what are you eating for lunch? And now these lunch bunchers will let you in on their jokes. It's really cute. So they interact with people and ask others to submit what they're eating for lunch as well. It's taken taken on more legs than just their school. So you can find them by, I'm sure, Googling them and the Johnson Central High School Lunch Bunch TikTok and find out what they're eating. They feel like they're on their own episode of The Office. The next story, the next story is about flying as well. Woman's encounter with badly behaved child is what the title of this next story is. And it has to do with a little kid on a flight in front of you. You're sitting behind them. And what happens next? Foosh, can you please play the audio for this? Because I can't I can't do it justice. So today on my flight from Atlanta to Denver, um, there was about an hour left in the flight and the kid in the seat in front of me turned around and went (laughs) like that with spit flying all over my face and my husband's arm. So I get it. Like traveling with kids can be hard, right? This kid was like three or four, four or five. But whatever, old enough to understand that you don't do that. So I was kind of shocked and the parents reacted and like told her not to. And then it just became a thing. And she again fought against them, turned around in the seat and spit on us again. 
this time I put my hand up just to block the spit from me and um, her parents kind of like grabbed her and had her sit down well she fought it was her mom on one side and her dad on the other she was the only child she was in the middle seat she fought them trying to turn around and spit at us some more and she did she turned around and a third time now when I say spit I mean she was but spit was going everywhere right how would you have reacted I need to know what you guys would have done before I tell you what we did I need to know what you would have done okay another thing that I probably could have mentioned she goes on is yeah. that both of her parents were wearing a mask she obviously was not um and they clearly had no control. Two adults could not control a four-year-old child. Uh, anyway, now go ahead and tell me what you would have done. <laughs> She's funny to think that you can control a four-year-old child. First of all, that's her first mistake in thinking that that's something that can be mitigated, especially during uh, such a sensory overload like flying. But as you heard, TikToker Shayla Monier, this, that's the woman's voice you heard, uploaded this footage to TikTok. Because that's where you go to get some sort of galvanization. You want people to be on your side. You want that confirmation bias. Then you upload it to your to your platform in hopes that people will agree with you. But what she found out in asking what people would have done is that not everyone saw what Shayla did as being the proper way to address this issue. Yeah, there are some people who said you should have. The, the parents should have been controlling the kid better. They, like Shayla kind of was insinuating, should have put a mask on the child since they too were wearing masks. And others went against it and said, hey, it's just a kid. Just a kid. Can't really control a kid. Kids are going to spit. Kids are going to do this. They're just having fun. Hey, maybe it was this kid's first flight. All of these kind of, hey, 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 hypotheticals. But Shayla doubled down. She's like, absolutely not. I am a grandmother of six. She doesn't sound like it there. She doesn't look like it in her TikTok. But she says, hey, I have experience with children and I know how to control kids. You don't let that happen, especially in a public space, especially in a tight space like on an airplane. Jackie, Steph, have you guys ever been on a plane where that there's a child doing something obnoxiously and it's hard maybe to get them to stop or you're trying to make eyes with the parent to get them to kind of control the kid. What, what happened quickly? So I had a um, kid on Southwest. This is why I, I try to get on first, but um, <laughs> I had a kid on Southwest who was constantly, there was a seat in between us. So there was no reason why it should have happened, but he just kept kicking me, just kicking me over and over, not like kicking my seat, but he was in the same row with me. And was literally kicking me. Oh, no. How and long was your flight? It's two and a half hours. Oh. So, and I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm still praying on my patience. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so I kind of looked at her and I said, one of us is going to discipline this kid. And then she asked for a different seat. Oh, but it worked out. That worked out for you. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Steph? For me, it was just a kid that was kind of, I, th I don't remember what he was crying about, but something got taken away and he just was not stopped screaming. And oh, so, no. uh, I'm not one for confrontation, <laughs> but my ex at the time, she was. And so she just completely told them off. And then that was the end of it because then I think they, same as Jackie, I think they switched seats or they, she just made sure that he didn't make any more noise. <laughs> you never saw the child again. Yeah. <laughs> the kid just kind of disappeared yeah. just beneath the seat, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, this, that can happen, obviously. So. Shayla is saying when that happens, if you are the parent or guardian, control your kid, get your kid under control, slap a mask on him, whatever you need to do. Don't let him blow spit bubbles. Don't let him kick Jackie's seat and definitely don't let him yell during Steph's flight. How dare you? When we come back, we're going to get into the second part of the viral load. Why investing in Lego is actually more lucrative than investing in stocks. That's why all these Lego thefts are happening around the Southland and also does your son or a young man in your life want a chiseled jawline? What are they doing to get it? That's up next on the viral load. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. It's Later with Mo Kelly and back to the viral load with me, Tiffany Hobbs of the viral load. This story is about Lego, but not the theft 
collecting, not the stealing of Lego. No, we're doing a different story because it went viral. This man, Shane O'Farrell, 35-year-old from Teaneck, New Jersey, but originally from Ireland, has collected Lego all of his life. He started off really in the 90s collecting Lego sets, different kits, and there was a popular park in his hometown in Ireland that he would visit often that had to do with Legos. It was called Fort Lego Rado. He loved it. Well, as he's been collecting Lego all these years, he wasn't really paying attention to how the value was going up and going down. He was a kid. He was young. He didn't really care. Just buy me Legos. Doesn't matter. 20 years into his Lego collecting is where Shane has gone viral because he has shared a new type of hustle, a new type of side gig, and that is the buying, selling, and trading of Lego sets. Here's how he found out. Shane started paying attention to how, again, the price of Lego sets were increasing and decreasing, much like the stock market. And Shane actually equates his collecting of Legos to being more lucrative than investing in stocks, bond, and bonds and gold. He says he was watching over the course of 20 years specific sets that he had go up in value, triple, quadruple, quintuple, however, whatever, five times as much as what they were before. And he decided he would sell these sets as an investment opportunity, invest and sell, flip. Basically, this is his real estate. These are his avocados. This is his drug trade, whatever you want to call it. He is using this to make the money that many of us could dream of. He is a savvy service engineer on one side, but on the other side, he is a very lucrative Lego investor. And in the past two years alone, his toy trading has netted him five dollars hundred thousand dollars five hundred thousand dollars and he goes on to brag that the time it takes for him to do this is minimal he's like i have a full-time job and this is just supplementary income that's what he said he drove the knife in even deeper into our collective conscience because he's making five hundred thousand dollars on top of his already lucrative salary as an engineer all from buying and flipping Lego. He has hundreds of thousands of dollars of Lego resales, and he calls it a part-time gig. I can't stand this man. I am jealous of this man. I want to know how this man was able to do it, and I'm upset that I played with my Lego sets and didn't necessarily save them, just like Barbie. People keep their Barbies in their pristine packaging, and before you know it, they're worth thousands of dollars. Meanwhile, I was cutting the hair off of my Barbies and drawing makeup on them. Now they're worth nothing. If I would have known then what I know now, that went viral. The next and last story in this sequence is about (laughs) wanting a chiseled jawline. If you have a young man in your life, maybe a son, a nephew, a student, a neighbor, whatever the case, you might notice that they're asking you for gum. They're asking you for gum more often. Why? Not because their breath is in in need of gum. Not because of that. No, because there's a new workout that has hit TikTok. It's not for your arms, not for your legs, not for your abs. It is for your jawline, your jawline. Kids are wanting to create the illusion of a sharper jaw. But your regular gum, your $2 pack of gum from the supermarket doesn't cut it. No, they want the more expensive gum that is specifically for something called mewing. M-E-W-I-N-G, which is a facial fitness technique that involves placing your tongue on the roof of your mouth to create the illusion of a sharper jaw. It comes from social media, and it's a trend that is known as look smaxing. I looked at this word, and I said, is it look smaxing? Is it look smaxing? I don't know, but it means the illusion of a sharper jaw. And these young boys, and probably some girls as well, 
are asking for gum so that they can chew and chew and chew and work out their jaw muscles. This trend pro- proliferated on TikTok and Reddit. First with grown men. So we have adult men to thank for this. And of course, this trend made it down to teenagers and younger than that as a part again of a facial fitness routine. The specific gum is called Mastic Gum and it's available from specific vendors, including Rock Jaw and Stronger Gum and Jawliner. All of these really, <laughs> really interesting names, right? But they all promise, again, a chiseled jawline, and they're supposed to help build these muscles. There are lots of parents who are weighing in saying that their kids are doing this. They're just chewing in a compulsory manner. They're asking for gum. There's a 14-year-old in this story who talked about it and said, hey, most kids my age want that sharp, defined jawline because of TikTok. They want to look like models and potentially be more attractive. It's kind of it's kind of problematic, I think, right, that they would actually take to this sort of strategy and work out their facial muscles. I don't know. I, it it It's kind of like sounds this is like the first example of, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, body dysmorphia that you yeah. always see for girls, young girls see all these, you know, women with all these surgeries and guys never really have that issue. That's kind of the first example I've ever heard when it comes to, to men. Yeah. Cause if they're young, they're not like, you know, in their twenties or thirties, they're 14, 15, like they're you teenagers. were saying. Yeah. So that's, it's interesting, but also, yeah, like you said, a little bit concerning. It's a little bit concerning, yeah. you know, especially when they are comparing themselves to grown exactly. men with yeah. different fat intake and different structures. And, you know, as we grow, we obviously know our faces change and they're not even giving themselves, these young boys, the the time for their faces to fully develop before they're trying to alter them in the name of being accepted on TikTok, right? They're even Photoshopping themselves and trying different lighting all to achieve this look. So as you said, Steph, yeah, it's, it's, it's concerning and it does definitely feel like a like a gateway into body dysmorphia if it's not already present in other ways. Right? Yeah, it could be it could harm their mental health for sure. Absolutely. Like, I didn't think about that, but it could for sure lead into other things or someone else is gonna think of another trend on TikTok and then that that'll take off and whatever it may be. I for- used to work in a dermatologist's office where they did plastic surgery and one of the things that horrified me was you would get moms who got plastic surgery and then were bringing in their, their daughters that were like 15, 16 oh, years old. No. And then you would just see this trend of, because once you start it, now you just, you're trying to live up to, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And so it's, it's, it's interesting how social media has made something that I thought was bad before exponentially worse. Yeah. Absolutely. All in the name, again, of these likes and, and, and reshares and popularity, that, that social capital. When we come back, we're going to talk about why a lot of these social media influencers that these young boys were following and that others may follow aren't actually doing as well financially as they present themselves to be. In fact, they're barely even getting by. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly On Demand from KFI AM640. It's later with Mo Kelly. I'm Tiffany Hobbs. We last talked about what's going on in the social media influencer world. And that specific story talked about how young men and and older men actually have been influenced to alter their faces or at least try to alter their faces to achieve a more chiseled jawline through the help of certain gum, kind of really tough gum that will work out your face. And this is all born of the influence of social media and wanting to achieve a certain standard. A lot of times when you're thinking about the standard that's been set on social media, it's due to the content creation of specific influencers. And those influencers are who many users on platforms like TikTok and Facebook and Instagram Twitch, YouTube may look to as a guide or a a, a linchpin, so to speak, as, as to how to achieve certain economic success. You want to get what they have. So 
you're going to be influenced by what they're doing. But there's a there's a little known secret that many of these influencers suppress. They don't want you to know. And that secret is that most of them are broke. They are broke, 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 and they are living beyond paycheck to paycheck. They're not even getting a paycheck because the work of an influencer is extremely unstable. This story comes from the Wall Street Journal specifically, and it says that social media influencers aren't getting rich. In fact, they're barely getting by. Like I said, many people dream of achieving the success of certain influencers. You may have heard of them. There's Mr. Beast with his millions upon millions. He may even be into the billions mark now of followers who watch his every move. And he gets paid a pretty penny, millions of dollars every year from different corporate sponsorships, speaking engagements, just to do what he does on TikTok and other other platforms, YouTube. Then there's Charlie D'Amelio, another very popular influencer. And these names, if you are following social media, and I, I don't follow it very closely, but I've heard of these people. These names are synonymous with social media success. You don't have to know what they do to know that they're successful at what they do. That's kind of where I am with it. There's a full-time content creator, like there are many. His name is Clint Brantley, and he was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal. He's been a full-time content creator for three years. What that means is on TikTok and YouTube, he posts videos about Fortnite, a very popular video game. And those those videos are about his reaction to different gaming strategies, different worlds, whatever it is. It's all about this video game. And through his interaction with that game, through his success, he's amassed 400,000 followers. He's doing pretty well by any stretch of the imagination. 400,000 followers, that's a small city, a large city in most places. He's doing really well. And these videos garner him on average 100,000 views per video. When you get to a certain view status, I think it's somewhere around a, maybe 10,000 views or so, you have YouTube and other other platforms asking if you'd like to monetize your content and they'll pay you to produce these videos. The pay is not that much. It increases by the number of followers you get. 100,000 views will not make you rich. And that's what Clint Brantley found out because he earned last year just under, just over $58,000. Now that's not bad depending on where you live. But his goal was to be a content creator who was making videos that would get him into the millions of dollars like his idols, Mr. Beast and Charlie D'Amelio. So $58,000, which is less than the medium median income pay in the United States for a full-time worker, was is not to his liking. He feels like a failure with his $58,000. And because of that, he's hesitant at 29 years old to sign an apartment lease. He's currently living with his mother. That's no problem. Do that. That's that's actually really economical and smart. But his reason is because he has a lot of anxiety around signing a lease because he does not know if his checks from YouTube and Twitch and TikTok are going to continue because such a thing is very unstable. It fluctuates with your exposure, with your popularity, with the engagement from your audience. So when he has a great month, he gets paid more. And when he has an off month, he gets paid significantly less. Social media platforms are also paying out less to their content creators. There are millions of content creators out there. You can call yourself a content creator if you, in fact, create content. You don't have to be well-known to be a content creator, but you do have to be well-known to become one of those who are using this as a lucrative form of employment. And for those people, only about 50 million of the hundreds or or millions of people are actually making any sort of money from it. Only about 50 million actually earn something from their content creation. And of those 50 million, half of them earn $15,000 or less. 
It's a side job. But many of them are spending the hours required that would be relegated for a full time job. So it's directly correlating to what they are doing to actually earn an income and what they're doing on the side via social media to try and eclipse that to earn an income full time as a content creator. And they're finding that the two aren't matching. It's not meshing. Again, there are only a certain number of people who are making anything sizable. Actually, it's 13% who are making over $100,000. And with that, even an even smaller number of people have become famous, like your Mr. Beast and Charlie D'Amelio. The numbers keep in decreasing the higher you get. It's a pyramid. It's effectively a pyramid scheme. And we all invest into it to make these people at the top richer. But the consequence of that is that the people at the bottom are all clamoring to get to the top. So they're doing what they can to become social media influencers like chewing gum to chisel their jaws or getting plastic surgery or doing things that could put them in embarrassing situations just for views and likes. And the anxiety related to it comes from the need to be constantly creating, because if you're not creating, you're not actually existing. It sounds very much like Amazon. If you have a an output requirement and you don't even know what that quota is, you'll never know if you meet it. The goalpost is constantly moving and it's the same for social media. When we come back, we're going to talk about another consequence of the economy and it has to do with baby boomers. With baby boomers. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. Last, we talked about the economic toll that social media is taking on influencers and the anxiety around feeling the need to produce content. You have to produce content to make money. Well, another sector of the population that is feeling that economic crunch happens to be the baby boomers. And the baby boomers are those born from 1946 to 1964. What's happening to them that is specific unto them? Well, they are now called not baby boomers, but boom mates. Boom mates. There's all these cute, catchy phrases that are used to essentially describe apocalyptic conditions. And here's why. What are boom mates, you might be asking? Well, Boommates are what I expected to have when I was 13 or 14 talking to my best friends and deciding that we wanted to maybe have a commune when we were in our 20s and 30s, maybe raise our kids together, all live on the same property, share resources. But instead, baby boomers are now being put into this situation where they're finding that economically they're not doing as well as they would have liked and they are currently empty nesters and they may have a large empty property. And instead of selling, they are filling up their homes with friends and other intergenerational people to share the resources, spread the wealth and make ends meet. And it's their solution to what is America's grinding housing crisis. Again, these baby boomers, these people are usually empty nesters at this point, and they have the land. They have the houses. Many people in that generation were lucky enough to be able to afford what it, what it took to buy a home back then, and they've held on to it, fortunately for them. But as prices have increased, whether it's groceries, whether it's property taxes, whether it's energy costs and other utilities, they're finding that their money isn't going nearly as far as they would like. And so, again, their their solution is to pair up and to live together. And you have married people. You have single people. You have people who are working. You have people who are not working. It is varied but it is what they consider to be a viable solution, again, to the housing crunch. And studies show that boom mates have actually been doing this for years, for many, many years. And instead of renting 
because a lot of people don't want to rent. They want to keep their homes. This is considered to be the more affordable, the more economical, the more responsible strategy. I'm going to ask Steph and Jackie to weigh in on this one. We're all around the same age. Okay. We're all in our thirties and above thirties and our forties. And we're all feeling, I imagine in some instances, the, the, the crunch of the housing crisis or know someone who is. Could you imagine yourselves living in a commune with your friends in the very near future, sharing the resources? Or would you rather continue to live uh, by yourself or in your current situation and just figure out how to make it happen? I love this question because I actually lived on an island called Saipan for two years. And Saipan. Yeah. Um, and it's, if you look it up, you have to zoom in like a hundred times because it's a tiny, tiny island. <laughs> but, um, there was a family there that they had land and they just, they kind of made it a compound. And so they all lived on the same plot of land. Um, it was, uh, one family, but there was, I think six houses on that plot of land. They grew their own food. They had a little mini farm. So they shared all the expenses and, you know, cut down on their cost of food and things like that because they became like little mini farmers. So I was so inspired by that family. That's the first thing I want to do. But I just have to like people enough to want to live yeah. around them for a long period of time. Yeah, you really have to find people you mesh with because if you're stuck with them, it's like, yeah. you know, what are you going to do? What do you, what do you think, Steph? I was uh, working on something, but I kind of have heard, I think I've heard of this because you, you said it's, they've been doing it for years, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think I heard of this a while ago and I thought, I thought it was weird at the time because I didn't know what bills were. <laughs> but, um, now I'm just like, you know what? I could totally do something like that because mm-hmm. I mean, it's no different than if you're living with, you know, roommates, but the dynamic would be different. So, you know, you probably can't bring like dates over the house. You can't have parties and stuff like that. But, you know, cause ideally you want your own space. But yeah. with the way it costs, that's not really a choice. So it's like, okay, you know what? I can sacrifice that to, because maybe you could actually save up money and start your own, you know, get, eventually get your own place, eventually get, you know, if you don't have a car, you get a car, like all that stuff. Unless you're a content creator and you're going to well, never yeah. do that. You're never, never living out. Of course not. <laughs> but I think as you get older, don't you appreciate the companionship as well? You, I mean, that's kind of the... What's implied here? I was going to say, that's what they get out of it. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Those of us on the outside are, are questioning how, how could you <laughs> how possibly, long? how long exactly? What are kind of the, <laughs> the, what's the straw there that could break the proverbial camel's back? But it's actually funny too that you said that thing about content creators because some of them that are, are really big, um, like the Mr. Beast types, they started living it, like it'd be six, it's usually guys. TikTok houses. Yeah, TikTok houses. It's like five or six guys, but it's like they'll start in a regular house, and then as they build, they start getting bigger and nicer houses, so their stunts get crazier and wilder and mm-hmm. all that stuff. So that happens sometimes, too. Yeah, it can be a very lucrative yeah. way, like you said, to to combine those resources and, and do something bigger and better and in hopes that people could then branch out and acquire their own independent living arrangement. In this case, these boom mates don't want to move out. And it's so uh, successful. It's so wanted that there are actual services that have been put in place, uh, like matchmaking services that will pair up people from that generation with others. One is called Home Share Online. So you can actually join the services and find a boom mate to live with and it is an essential or considered to be an essential service for those who are seniors and or workers unable to afford a place to live. At this point, it's all about homeless prevention. Call it boomates, give it a cute name, give it a website, whatever the case. It all speaks to the housing crisis and hoping to prevent that housing crisis from continuing to expand in the future. And those who are most vulnerable amongst us, our seniors, um, those who might be mentally disabled or whatnot, those people are who are being reached to so that they can be given some sort of support in being able to stand on their own or along with their friends. In this case, they could just fix inflation. They could just fix inflation and stop giving things cute little catchy names. But no, that would be that'd be too much like right, Jackie Ray. 
<laughs> it's been fun. Thanks for letting me hang out with you. I'll be here tomorrow and on Friday. And it's time for us to go. KFI AM 640, live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. Not just stimulating talk, it's more. KFI and KOST HD2. Los Angeles, Orange County. Live.